evaluation stage. Those of you who've been in a narcissistically abusive relationship, you probably move from being love bomb to suddenly being devalued to, oops, this is interesting. I don't know why that happened. Very intriguing. <laughs> you know, don't you hate it when, they, when, uh, when things um, go, oh, that's why I pushed the wrong button. Okay. So I'm here with you. Hey, so let's me start over again. There's nothing like trying to be on three different platforms at the same time. It gets a little tricky here, but we're going to talk about devaluation. Why seemingly this happens overnight. Have you noticed that? How you can go from being on the top of the world, thinking that you are the best thing, that you have met the love of your life. And the next thing you know, that you are, you are a piece of dirt, something they want to scrape off the bottom of your shoe. And, and it happened without even your notice. I mean, how did it go from you being the best thing ever to suddenly you're the worst thing ever? And why why weren't you more aware? Why wasn't there this moment that you thought, oh, yeah, okay, it's not going to work. But often it doesn't happen like that. It happens without our awareness of it. So I want to kind of dig into that, but I also want to take your questions about why this is happening. So let me, let me introduce myself first. I'm Dr. Carrie Kerr McAvoy. I'm a, I'm a licensed mental health clinician with over 20 years of counseling experience. And these days, I primarily talk about mental health issues, relationships, narcissistic abuse, those types of things. And I'm thrilled that you're here joining me with today because we're going to talk about the, the stages of a narcissistically abusive relationship, which goes from love bombing to devaluation to discard. And the discard can happen in a whole different variety of ways. And we may or may not get into that, but I want to talk specifically about the change from love bombing to devaluation. So the first thing that it's really important to understand is that one of the things that happens with all of us, and hey, you guys, it's so good to see you. I see all the people that I love and appreciate. I'm thankful for you guys hanging out with me, like Louise and Emily and Mar Mariel, and I just really appreciate you guys stopping in. And there's uh, a cis girl from Texas. Texas, hey, I'm in Texas too. I appreciate you guys being here. Um, so what happens is that most of us base our new relationship on some uh, somebody. When we meet somebody, we kind of have this idealized wish of who we'd see, who we'd meet. We have this wish list, you know. We hope that they're into our hobbies. We want to have a kind of shared lifestyle. We have sort of this hope and expectation. Now, nothing's ever perfect. And one of the things that happens when we start to build into this relationship is that we begin to... Um, we but get again to discard the idealization of it. We begin to realize, okay, maybe they don't sh maybe they don't want to spend every Saturday on the golf course, but that doesn't mean that I can't be happy about how what their handicap that day is or how well they've done. Um, but we begin to kind of we can begin to replace that unrealisticness with realisticness. But what happens with a narcissist or even with other cluster Bs, not maybe all of them, but some of them, is that their idealisticness is based upon a really old primitive structure, you know, back, I, I was thinking about this today, working on a script, thinking about it for toxic love on YouTube. And what I, I, it hit me, it's like the difference between an eight-year-old who's hungry and wants a cookie before dinner to a, a one-year-old who's hungry and wants a cookie before dinner. An eight-year-old, you can say, honey, I know you're hungry. You got to wait. It's going to be 15 more minutes, 10 more minutes, and then we'll all sit down and eat. Okay. They're hungry. They're not happy that you say that to them, but at least they're going to be able to walk away and, you know, distract themselves, watch the clock. You know, they can tell time. They have the structure internally to deal with that disappointment. But if you met a one, told a one-year-old uh, that they had to wait for 10, 15 minutes, they don't have the internal structure. All they feel is the need, the rage of the need. And what they're going to do is probably melt down and scream for the next 10, 15 minutes until you finally slam their little sweet seat into the high chair and feed them. That's the difference. So when we meet somebody who has less structures, less ego strength, less, less high functioning ability, then they also have that they don't have the same wherewithal to deal with their losses and setbacks and the things that really, that, that, that affect them. They want what they want when they want it. So when they meet you, they think you're the best thing ever. And they've built up this idealized picture, almost like this Cinderella fairy tale picture, of how you're going to fix everything that's wrong with them. You're going to fix all the insecurity, all the boredom, everything that's kind of not been right about their life. You're going to do that. And the problem is that's not really who you are. And you don't have that ability to sort of to do all of that. And so all it takes, though, is some disappointment. 
like you failed to be interested in the right thing, or maybe you had your first fight, or or maybe you aren't as available to what they want when they want it. You know, maybe you're not like having meals when they expect it, or you're not coming through sexually in the way that they wanted. It's going to be some kind of a, almost small. It almost will feel like so insignificant that to you, you'll say, yeah, well, that happens in every relationship because people are people. But for them, it's catastrophic. And suddenly that bubble of fantasy, that idealized wish of you being this rescuer from all that's wrong in their life just burst. And to them, the loss of that is the same level as a betrayal. It's like you dashed all their hopes and you left them with this intense discouragement and rage. And as a result, they flip into this, this narcissistic rage, then begin to see you differently and start to criticize you. So you move out of favor. You move literally from, you become moved from the pedestal and you crash to the earth or below the earth. So that's what happens with the devaluation stage. So let me kind of see what how you guys are doing, uh, what kind of thoughts you have re and reactions you have. Please put a thumbs up so that I know that you're talking to me um, because otherwise sometimes you're talking to each other and I want to make sure that I'm addressing the questions that's targeted to me. Somebody asked, what is toxic love? Toxic love is a year-long series that I'm doing over on YouTube. It's a longer content. It's like eight to 12 minute long. And then I'm trying to use kind of current day um, popular um, examples to help you sort of envision what I'm talking about. Like what this week that's coming out is talking about, I'm trying to remember what it's about. It's, uh, it's, a it's, <laughs> oh, why, why, uh, yeah, it's why narcissists don't like us to cry. And I'm actually using a lot of uh, mental healness as explanation from a narcissistic perspective. Last week, I used Breaking Bad and it talked about cognitive dissonance and how um, Walter created such cognitive dissonance for Skylar that just made her feel like she was going crazy. And uh, so next week's is going to be on um, on the de devaluation. And I'm going to be using the movie, The Invisible Man. What happened in that movie? Did you guys see that movie? Man, did it, it impact you as hard as it impact me? I think I've watched it twice. Now, the first time was really ironic because I watched it with my I watched it with my narcissist when I was, I was in the marriage at the time. And so he and I watched it together. So I didn't really react because ugh, here I'm living what I'm watching. I'm living, I'm in this, you know, fear, this relationship with a lot of fear. And he's right there beside me. But I watched it recently, like with, it's called The Invisible Man with Elizabeth Moss. I watched it recently with my sons and my hands started shaking. I was having this massive, this massive <laughs> flashback and triggers to it. So oof, it's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're the same thing, Phoenix. So you watched it with them. And then when the new one came out, it made you cry. Yeah, it, it is intense. It's a good picture of a narcissistically abusive relationship. Now it's a horror flick, please. For those of you who've not seen it, don't know what we're talking about. It's scary. I mean, it's based on HG Wells wrote the, wrote the, the book on it and it's based on a book, but it's, it's scary. It's called the invisible man, the invisible man. So how are you doing? How many of you, let's ask this question, let's take a poll. How many of you have been dis devalued, experienced the love bombing to devaluation? Let's just right now stop. And if you have had that happen, put a heart. I want you to put a heart emoji in the comment section. Oh yeah, Muriel, you have, huh? Yep. I certainly did. Yep. Oh, lover of love uh, um, definitely had been. Somebody's being filtered. Oh, I didn't know there's a filter system on TikTok and somebody's filter questions are being filtered all over the place. Oh, I see all the hearts coming in, you guys. Man, yeah. Oh, and Lois, thank you so much. I've seen you a lot of your activity on my on my my videos over. I appreciate that. I th appreciate you interacting with my stuff. It means a lot. Thank you guys so much. So, so what was it? What was the hardest or the most confusing part about it? And how long from the devaluation was it before the discard started to happen? I would love to hear that. Um, yeah, it, it would be really interesting to hear what, what happened with, with that, whether or not you, was it short period of time? Did you kind of stay in the devaluation stage? Was it sort of a lot of breadcrumbing did you have? So Ellen said it was a month apart. Angela said it was weeks. She only had weeks. Mariel said, you realize you're being used. Exactly. 
Oh, so White Wolf said, I now work for one and I'm being backed into a corner. Yeah. Have you been devalued, White Wolf? Yeah, you, have you been? You did put a heart up. So apparently you did. Jenny said six months. Interestingly for me, I think mine was, my occurred, my my uh, fall from grace, I think occurred on the honeymoon for sure, which was delayed. So we've been married two months in and we stuck it out for another two years, but it was but he had ulterior motives for those who know my story, who read the book, love you more know what he was after. So he stuck around because he had reasons to stick around, not because he wanted to stick around. In fact, I caught a letter. I caught a letter that he had sent. He had a girlfriend that I didn't know about. He had a girlfriend the entire time I knew him. I didn't know that would never have gotten in a relationship with him if I'd known that, but he, he had written her a letter in November. So we were married in June, late end of June, it really at, literally at the end of June so really July and August, September, October. So it was four and a half months into the marriage. I already, I knew already fell from grace. And I caught a letter where he'd written to his girlfriend and said he was in prison, that the marriage was a prison. That's so, <laughs> I'll tell you how he felt about being married. So yeah, yeah. Oh, Diane, Diane. So you had a, a partner who said, love you more. Oh my, my own, that was a competition between us constantly. Yeah. Who, who loved whom the more? I just hated it. He would never say love you spontaneously. It always had to be sort of like competitively, like love you more. Yeah. So Wendy's, uh, Wendell said, went from talking, is it, is it uh, Wendell Lynn? Lynn, is that really actually your name? Or you put your last name first and your, your first name last. You went from talking to marriage to cheating with his best friend, 21 year old wife. Ooh, man, I'm sorry. Oh, Madam said he called me suffocating. Yeah, they, they say the most hurtful stuff. Hurtful stuff. White Wolf has been describing his or, his or her. I want to say you're a man because of the, I don't know why. White Wolf to me feels masculine, but um, maybe I'm wrong. White Wolf, I'm sorry if I'm wrong, but you've been misrepresented the job and now you're being, you're supposed to get a vehicle and now the vehicle you're not getting and now you left a 20 year old narcissistic relationship with just a clothes on your back. And you need the, Oh, you're a woman and you need the job in the car. Yeah. I bet you feel trapped. I bet you feel really stuck. Yeah. It is amazing how they do a smear campaign, Emily. They really do do that. Um, I've, I've experienced it again just recently. Someone's been, I think, smearing me as well. And it's painful. You know, it's, it's unfair. It's back to part of the devaluation stage. So let's go back into that again, psychologically. So you failed to, to live up to this fantasy, this fantasized expectation that was never realistic that you could never live up to. I mean, literally, you know, that Jerry Maguire movie where he says, you complete me please run. If anybody ever says that to you, run, because you're never going to complete anybody. Everybody has their own difficulty. We have to face the own in, in, inadequacies within ourselves. We, we can't fix somebody else's inadequacies. So, But they have this, this need and hope that you're going to make them more secure, more confident, that you're going to somehow like shore them up and make them all this. And then when you don't, when you're just you, when you're human and you and somehow, you know, act human, then there's this rage, this just like this one-year-old being told they can't have a cookie because dinner is five minutes or 10 minutes away. This rage for you not somehow coming through with everything in this undo, unrealistic and idealistic way. It's impossible for you to do that. So, so this rage is, is primitive. It's, I'm using the example of a one-year-old intentional you're actually seeing somebody at, at a one-year-old emotional level if they're intentionally angry at you. And so then they build up all this justification about why you didn't do it, that you must be this, you know, mean-spirited, withholding, awful, you know, broken, damaged person, dis, you know, despicable person. So they create this justification for the rage because it's so basic. It's, it's almost without words. It's so deep, so primitive. It's like goes all the way back to the very, very, very young. And as a result, they latch it onto you and then they begin to just tear you to pieces. So then they also then have to ruin you because in their opinion, they feel violated by your failure to show up. And again, none of this is rational. I mean, when we try to make it make sense, it's not going to make sense, but because you have violated this intrinsic wish that they had, then they need to annihilate you. And the way they annihilate you is they begin to smear you. 
and disrespect you and disregard you. And so they do this massive effort to sort of as if as if people need to pick sides, they sort of like force this thing to happen where there are sides to get picked. And then whether or not you even know it, I mean, you may not even you you may want nothing to do with that at all. You may be trying to like stay super, super clear. But unfortunately, their their neediness, their in their brokenness will cause this this chasm, this this chasm to happen. And so that you end up with this horrible situation. And a lot of us, unfortunately, lose a lot of our relationships as a result. People who, partly because narcissistic people are so magnetic and charismatic, and people can't really believe that they have this dark side, so they, they think that you're exaggerating. So then you end up looking like the crazy one for talking about it. But also partly because they don't want to piss this person off. Because this person, maybe they need their approval. There's some power dynamics there going on. So there's lots of compli com complicated reasons why people, sorry, I realize that, that YouTube is having this big picture of, <laughs> but there's lots of complicated reasons why um, people just don't, they don't see through it. They just don't see through it. It makes them uncomfortable. So they would rather choose the person with the most social power and usually Narcissists are very good at wielding a lot of social power. Have you noticed that? That when you're around this person, you feel a desire to sort of fawn or make up or appear good in their eyes. And even when you know in your head that it's not logical, that it really doesn't matter. This person actually, in the end of the day, isn't going to make or break your life. But you, you still find yourself sort of like doing that. Well, that's what everybody else is feeling around them. So it, it just becomes, or like a white wolf situation. I have a feeling white wolf that you're in a, you're in a relationship you're around a malignant narcissist based upon what you're telling me. If people are avoiding him, then then he is so toxic. He is so he's like the Roy Logan. If you guys have been watching Succession, <laughs> I'd be avoiding him too. But if, if he's not, if he's more like, what would be a good charismatic narcissist that still would make your life hell? But on the other hand, you it's hard not to like them. If you guys can think of an example from some show that you see, that would be really great. I'd love that. Somebody asked me a question uh, about therapy and I saw it flash through and then I, I want to go back to it. Maybe if you're still here, if you can ask me again, I would appreciate that. Oh, there it is. So Zenic Warrior asked, do you do a professional therapy for coming for people coming out of narcissistic relationships? I don't. I don't. But what I am doing, thank you for asking that. What I am doing these days, it's let me kind of back up and explain about therapy. Therapy, counseling in the United States is really super tough because it's governed by state licensures. Now, I'm, I am licensed, but I would have to see people in the state that I'm licensed in. So that means I would be limited. I can't see anybody who's not in that state. And so, and also it is, yeah, that's the big issue. And it also is governed by insurances. So then I'd have to participate with all the insurances and have to be a participating, it's called participating provider. It's a lot of work. And then I have to do all the billing and comply with all the electronic requirements of HIPAA and all of that. It's extremely difficult. Plus I, I counseled for 30 or 20 years, over 20 years. And I just kind of burnt out. I got really, I quit when my husband was diagnosed with cancer. I've been married twice. I was married 31 years to a really great guy. He was diagnosed with cancer in 2014 and passed away in 2015. And I just kind of like was tired of, I've done it. I've done it 20, 20 years and I saw myself moving towards retirement and then I'm grieving. So I knew I was in the position really to see people. And then I ended up in that second marriage, which was brief for two years to a narcissistic sociopath, which was catastrophic. And uh, when I, when I was wrapped that relationship up and got out, my son at that time, had been diagnosed with leukemia. I know it just like, really? So you went from a dying husband to a narcissistic relationship and then you got out just as your other, your, your oldest son was diagnosed with leukemia. Yes. So the six to eight months with him in, in, in and out of treatment near death several times, it was awful. Thank God he's in remission. I'm so thankful. And, uh, but I, these days, you know, I, I write, uh, I'm thinking about working on another book right now. I just published a book with Lisa Sunny called Surviving to Thriving. It's not in the bookstores yet. It'll probably be in the bookstores by the end of this week, but it is available. I'm going to, I'm offering it already. I know she has it available as a PDF. So um, it's a workbook. It's the six step blueprint for narcissistic abuse, healing and recovery. So we just, we just finished that book. So if you're interested, please get a hold of me and I would be happy to give you a link to that book. 
I don't even think I have it on my, yes, it is in my link tree. So you guys can find it in my link tree. I'm so thrilled. This book uh, is six different things like how to overcome grief, how to let things go, how to master your boundaries. And it's come from a psychological, it comes from a psychological perspective. And if you're on my email list, just as a reason to join my email list, how do you join my email list? Um, you can even you can even email me and say, I want to be on your email list. You'll get five dollars off. That's why you want to join my email list. I'm about ready to I'm about ready to give it give it to everybody a five dollar coupon who wants the book who's on my email list. Link tree is the link in my bio. Someone's asking, what is your link tree? Link tree is the link in the bio. So anyway, back to counseling. So these days, what I'm doing, I was leading up to something. I have a membership club. It's not cheap. I want to warn you, it's not cheap. It is less than a cost of one coaching call a month. But what you get is if you go to the higher tier, the more expensive tier, you get weekly office hours with me, group office hours where I go live with you on a video call and we talk about your issues. I also weekly upload trainings or a guided uh, meditation or a skill building uh, ex exercise so that you can kind of improve your health and understand what's causing you to holding you back in your healing. You also get a, a year's worth of email tips to sent to your inbox. You also get access to the past webinars. You get an invitation to the upcoming webinar, which is the end of August with Lee Hammock. That's going to get into the mind of the narcissist and that's exclusive to members only, although they can offer tickets to guests, but it's exclusive to the membership. And you also get access at the higher tier to my online course and my book, all for the cost of less, less than one coaching call a month. And I'm super excited. I have a very active group uh, of delightful people. And then they talk and support each other 24-7. So if this is something, if you're looking for support and you're really struggling to find the right kind of counseling or coaching, you're really kind of like just hitting, hitting it, you know, not finding the right match, really consider joining Toxic Free Relationship Club. It's really amazing. It's amazing. And I make sure that it's value packed from a lot of um, professional advice and wisdom, a lot of contact with me. You know, I, I'm very active in the group. I'm act, I, I, I answer questions individually. So when you have an issue or a problem that comes up, you can contact me directly. If money is a problem, I want you guys to hear me. Some of you say, listen, I'm, I barely am making it. I don't have the $75 or $100 a month to join. If money is a problem and you think this is what I need, please contact me directly and we will make it a way for you to be a part of that group for on a, on a discount. I don't want, I don't want money to stand between you and getting the help that you need. But if you'd like to find a good coach, I'd be happy to send you to a couple coaches that I think the world of again, DM me and I'd be happy to, because I do know, and this is a true problem. And you've seen one of my lives, I'm sorry, one of my videos recently, a lot of therapists have not been trained in narcissistic abuse. It just isn't a part of the graduate study. So, um, Oh, Janine, Janine's part of my group. Yeah. Thank you, Janine. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it is a great group. And Janine's an amazing part of that group. And I really appreciate that. Thank you for saying that. Okay, discard. Disc, I'm sorry, devaluation. So here's a big question I have for you all. Because one of the things that happens in a narcissistically abusive relationship is our, they begin to erode our self-esteem. We begin to see ourselves from their perspective and start to feel less than. And then when the devaluation happens, then you're experiencing all this criticism and nitpicking and you feel their loathing for you the way that sometimes they feel contempt or disgust for you. And it starts to really affect our sense of self. So how are you doing with healing from that? Because I think that's a pivotal part of recovery from that is disowning it. And I'll tell you personally, it's hard. Here's one of the ways that mine really worked on my identity. Um, I mean, I'm in my 50, I was in my 50s at the time. I've never been a skinny woman, not ever in my life, even at my thinnest. And I've been thin, but I, I've never been skinny. And so I'm always on the upper edge of the, you know, the, the bell curve when it comes to normal weight. Never been in the middle or at the bottom, always sort of the top end. So I had some kind of psychological issues about that because I grew up with a I grew up with it being in my face. You know, it was always like an issue. So it was being ridden. I was being always. Someone was commenting on it or it was, you know, always being brought to my attention. 
So here I am, whereas my first husband that, you know, passed away, he, he said I was beautiful, he loved me just the way I was, and it was never an issue. But my second husband, the narcissist, he would make sure to make these little jabs. I write about it in the book. One of the things he would say is he would say this, and he said it more than once. He would say, my mother always said that I was never into Barbie dolls. That's what he would say. My mother was never into my, that I was never into Barbie dolls. And so he was saying that I didn't have a hourglass or actually Barbie's figure is impossible, but, but he was saying that I wasn't a skinny or thin woman. And then I would say to him, that hurts. You know, that hurts. Who, what woman would not, would want to hear that? How would, I don't know why. And then he would say, then he'd gaslight me. I don't know why you take that so personally. I'm just talking about the fact that I'm, I'm so accepting. I'm like, yeah, but I want to, but he would never, no, I don't think ever once, I don't think ever once, not even a love bombing, did he ever say that I was beautiful or that he thought I looked gorgeous? I mean, he called me gorgeous, but it was a name he gave me. It really wasn't like, really, it became a meaningless name. It was a pet, it meant, meant nothing. But it wasn't like he said to me, oh my goodness, thank you. What, what lucky man I am to walk out with you today. I never got to hear that. I got to hear it with my first husband, but I never got to hear it with the second one. So it ended up for me, what happens, because lately I, I'm near the heaviest I've ever been in my life. I've had two complete total hip replacement surgeries. So I've had to basically learn to walk again in the last year and a half, two years. It's been hard. I'll tell you, recovery has been really, really hard. And as a result, I've been very, very sedate, more sedate than I've ever had in my life. So the weight wants to come on, even though I've not changed how I eat or anything. So I hear that. So I put on my clothes and I hear in his head, my head, I've never been one for Barbie dolls. And it, I'll tell you, it, it, it's, it hits me. It, it's something I have to actively work against. So what are the ways in which you have to actively work against the devaluation that you experienced in your life? I'm going to start reading your comments. Yes, yeah, some of you said, same here. I struggle with that, same here. And then Emily said, narcissists just don't compliment us. You're right, they don't. Yeah. Oh, so twin, you've had to learn to walk again too. I'll tell you that total hip replacement. I had both hips done. <laughs> wow. They were done three months apart. Wow. I I'm glad I did it. I, I really don't regret the decision, but I'll tell you the recovery was not easy, was not. The pain was through the roof. It was through the roof. Yeah. I'm sorry. I had to hear it, hear it too. Since since he girl, I do I do regret having to hear that. Yeah, it, it was hard. So you had a, a vitamin deficiency and was in the month for five for the hospital for five months. Yeah, water walking is really amazing. I am in the pool. I'm in the pool nearly every day these days. Really working on my legs a lot this lately. It is difficult, West Coast nurse. It, it, that's a good point. It's isn't it amazing? There's something kind of profoundly different about narcissistic abuse where they we hear them in our head. We like really hear them in our head. I don't, I don't hear other people. I mean, I've, I've gone to graduate school. I've had mentors. I've had a lot of people, authority figures in my life. And I don't hear them, the negativity of them in the same way that I hear the negativity of him. And he wasn't even in my life for that long. Isn't that interesting? I mean, some of these other people I would have worked with longer and knew, you know, more significant relationships, but they didn't have the same kind of impact. They have this way that it's back. This is what I think it is. And I can't say for sure that this is based on research, but this is some of my theories. I think the love bombing and the, the initial the initial brainwashing that happens to all of us that makes us it increases our fear of risking loss and and the fear of abandonment increases our dependency to such degree that we attach our need for their approval at a higher level than we normally do with most adult people. That there's something about something that happens there that makes them speak at a more primitive level. They, they kind of begin to sort of rework our sense of self at a deep level. It's very insidious how it does that. I have a feeling that if we were to talk to a kidnap victim, you know, say someone who's been held hostage by a terrorist group, I'm thinking of, for example, of Patty, Patty Hearst. If we could talk to somebody who survived that kind of mentality for a long period of time, we would find that that person got into their head too, that we'd find there's some similar, I'm not saying we're hostage victims. Please, if anybody's experienced that, I'm not comparing our experience, my experience to trying to survive a horrible situation like that. But I do think 
there's something similar about the programming, the cult-like programming that happens that causes it causes this this um this damage to our sense of self that we have to sort of undo exactly the St Stockholm syndrome. It has been shown that the similarities between those who get trapped in a cult to those who've been in a narcissistically abusive relationship is, is similar. There's actually similar. There's it's we've experienced cult-like programming. They actually even looked at it side by side, the excessive eye gazing, the uh, the degree that they make us feel like we're going to belong the the over the over um it's even their mirroring of our behavior in order to create intense uh, sense of rapport and attachment and trust um it's just it's it's incredible it's incredible and they do this they do this and it gets it gets into deeply into us and then begins to have a profound effect on our sense of self which increases our sense of dependency and also begins to build in learned helplessness. How many of you felt that where you literally were in the relationship and you felt like you didn't know how to get out? I mean, here you might've been highly accomplished in your life and yet you're struggling to make basic decisions about what to do next or what you wanted for dinner or, or how to make, you know, these, these ways. I mean, I know some of us, they literally strip money from us. So there's actual financial abuse and we have limited control and access. But we also, but we also though have an eroded sense of our own competency, our own agency. So we feel increasingly like unable to do things that we should be able to do. I have somebody right now who's texting me who says, I'm helpless. I can't get out. I can't do anything. And there's a part of me, it's like, I recognize that feeling, but I also know that that's not completely the truth. Because if you think about it, if you were trapped in a really horrific situation, say that you were in a cave, you know, a cave in. You, even if it took like, and you had water, let's say you had enough water and maybe you had some food for a while, you would, you would take whatever it took to, even if it was just to dig a cup of dirt out every day, you would do it to get out. But for some reason, when we get into these relationships, we like feel like those things are not possible because they use fear and intimidation to such level that we just don't feel like it's possible. Hey, I appreciate the request to join me on the lives. I don't take um, I don't invite people in unless I know them. And so I have to have this planned ahead. So for those of you who'd love to go live with me, I'd be interested in that. But we need to be, we need to, um, you need to ask me ahead so that it's not a surprise because I need to know who you are. Otherwise it just, ah, to me, it feels way too scary. Yeah. Somebody, some, some of you have been asking, why is it so similar? Why, why are our stories so, so oddly, oddly the same? You know, and so I, th this is why I think the reason I think they're oddly the same is because the dynamics are so similar because their mentality, their worldview, the way in which they're very, the way that they see the world is the same. And as a result, then they use the same tactics. So when you, if you think about it, so if, if you were, I'm trying to think of a good example, actually, you know, okay. So as a, a psychologist, I've met thousands of people come in and they talk to me. And most of our issues actually are quite the same, really. It's not really a lot of differences and not a lot of variation. Most people come in because something's going on with one of their relationships and they don't really know why it's not working better. And they usually have tried lots of solutions and, it's, and it usually is not working and they want help. I mean, it's very similar, right? You see, you understand what I'm saying? It's not like, it's not like there's a lot of difference between a lot of people. People, we're a lot the same. We have the basic need to be loved, basic need to belong, you know, basic need for safety. So you take it, you take somebody whose mind's competitive and they they're they're ruled by jealousy and they're afraid of shame. They're again, they're gonna act quite a lot alike. Not to say there's not variations, but they're gonna act a lot alike, which is why you feel the similarity between them all. Yeah, so I'm glad, West Coast nurse, that you are out and that you're wanting your peace. Yeah, Ben Debbie, they are predictable. I agree with you with that. It does feel like that white wolf. White wolf said it feels like they all went to the same college and graduated. Yeah, it is. They do, they do have this this mentality that feels very very much the same. Absolutely. Oh, oh. Erica said that she would competed, won a bikini competition, and he told her her arms were too big, and that she was a meathead. Sheesh. Yeah, I I've even noticed that. I, I've actually um. I was part of a, a group of women who were all, uh, 
all in a relationship with a sex addict. So a lot of these were narcissists, actually. And they had this sexual addiction, so they were acting out. And I looked at the group of women that made con constructed this group, and they were good-looking women. Almost all of them were very... I mean, if you think about it, you know, sex addicts means they're also into porn. They're also usually addicted to porn nearly universally. So what are they watching? Well, they're watching airbrush people who have impossible bodies. And so they tend to pick women who are really good looking. And, uh, and it was eerie. It was eerie. And yet every single one of those guys, that was never enough. So the, anybody who ever says, oh, if the women just looked better, or their partner, it's not even exclusive to women. If their partner just looks better, then they would never step out. No, <laughs> that's nothing to do with it. And thank you, Erica. Your example is a great, you're a great example. It is nothing about our sufficiency. We're not ever sufficient. It's it's because it's impossible. Jennifer said hers said she should weigh for a height of five feet, a hundred pounds. Sheesh. Goodness. I hope you didn't listen to him because that would be impossibly thin. I wish you could stay too. It's so nice to meet you, West Coast nurse. I really appreciate it. I see several of you, like White Wolf is new too. So I and then Since Girl to Texas is new. So several of you are new to me, who've been chatting up me up today. I really appreciate it. I'm going to be here for another like 20 minutes before we wrap up. Um, but I appreciate you guys stopping by. Yeah, it is super, super strange how they do do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm proud of you, White Wolf, that you left with the clothes on your back and you got that job. See, that is where you're working against the learned helplessness. Absolutely. Ellen, please say your question again. I just saw you. I, I'm, if there's so many questions coming through. I have not seen it. So can you repeat it? And I apologize for missing it. It is amazing. I, I left. Now, I wasn't financially strapped. Oh, okay. There it is. Do, do narcissists know they're doing this or, or is it on autopilot like breathing for them? I think it depends, Ellen. I really do. I think sometimes... For some of them, the, the more psychopathic or the sociopathic they are. So this is how I kind of view them. This is kind of, this is Carrie's, this is Carrie's continuum. So on a narcissism scale, you have everybody somewhere on the narcissistic scale. Hopefully most of us are very low and we know how to, you know, lick our own wounds and we know how to be realistic and set our real expectations and to deal with disappointment and deal with our boredom. So hopefully we're very low end and on to the healthy end, but everybody's somewhere. So the higher you are on the pathological scale, the more the more egocentric you are, the more kind of competitive you become, the more jealous. But there's also another continuum that is intersecting the narcissistic spectrum, and that is antisocial personality disorder or psychopathic or psych you'll hear us also say psych psychopathy or sociopathic. That group is cold-bloodedly ruthless, and they are they view themselves as superior. See, a narcissist feels like they're a fraud and they're hoping they're not found out. Whereas a psychopath doesn't feel like a fraud. They really do believe they're a superior human being and they just deserve because they are unique. And they're special. So the rules don't apply to them. But a lot of narcissists have some blend of psychopathy and the higher they are on it, the more likely they are than more strategic, uh, more predatory, and they're more, also more deceptive and ruthless. So it kind of depends. I think if you just got a straight on narcissist who's who's all about defense, like not being found out as a fraud, that's more unconscious. They're doing more things more instinctually. And they're just very good at it. And they just learn how to protect themselves better and better. But if you have someone who's got a blend, the larger the blend, the larger the psychopathy piece to it is, the more likely that they're doing it strategically, more planned. So it kind of varies. So it's not one fits all, unfortunately. Some of them don't know, and some of them really do know what they're doing. It is scary when you meet one who does know what they're doing. Now, there are none of them are none of them are um, harmless. I want to say that that the more pathological you are, the more harmful you are. But uh, so you can't have a lot of narcissistic tendencies and not be harmful. But when you add the psychopathy into it, then you're really adding in the danger. There is how to get on my list. If you guys want to know, is your partner nar just narcissistic or if he's psych psychopathic, sociopathic, just narcissistic, I'm sorry, just psychopathic and sociopath. So it's the three groups. There's just the narcissist. There's just the psychopath and socio sociopath. And then there's the blend. If you want to know which partner type of partner you have, I have a questionnaire that's free. 
and it will get you on my emailing list and uh, it, you will learn, you'll figure, it'll kind of help you figure that out. It's in my link tree near the top. Yeah. Um, so the covert narcissist, Emily says, I'm in a relationship. So what would the blend look like, Nikki? Because you asked that first. A blend is um, more sadistic and cruel, a little more ruthless. Um, they're a little, a little less in touch with their emotions, more, a little more colder, emotionally cold. Um, yeah, it's, it's more predatory. It feels like more robotic. You might see more robot or if they're sociopath, it's more volatile. They use a lot of intimidation and fear. Um, they're more kind of mercurial in their moods. It, whereas a narcissist is just flat on, you know, grandiosity and very egocentric and, but they're, they have more of an insecure core. My doctorate's in psychology. I'm a clinical psychologist. Yeah. Um, robotic is describing the psychopath, Alani, Alani. That's what, Alani, I don't know if I'm saying you're right. Please forgive me for that. But, you know, robotic is more a psychopathic person. What do I think of, oh, so I want to answer this question first. I started out about the covert narcissism. Covert narcissism is the same of a narcissism, but instead of emphasizing their best, their superiority or their greatness, they emphasize their victimhood. So they sort of like play off the card of they're the biggest victim. Everything's always, so they're the, they're the introverted or the sort of the inverse of the grandi, the kind of the grandiose type. So the grandiose would lead with being very out there. The, the covert is going to be withdrawn and more reserved, where the grandiose is going to be more about look at me and the, the covert is going to like, don't, nobody looks at me. It's the inverse. Yeah. Yeah. So he didn't, he'd imitate you. So I'm going to jump over to the question of what do I say to a guy who says he likes his women barefoot and pregnant? I, you know, part of that is misogyny. <coughs> it's, it's a cultural bias that, but it also, there, it reeks of, there, it reeks of a lot of uncomfortable things. Like one is it reeks of objectification of women, but also women as servants. Um, and, and to me, I would see that as somebody who likes likes control. He probably would define himself as an alpha male, although alphas really actually don't exist in natural environment. When you have animals that are able to run free, that actually is not a thing. It was only found in captivity. Captivity. So, um, yeah. So I would say, I would say that I, I would flee from somebody who said that. I would like, uh, bye. I agree with you, Nikki. Uh, bye. That's what I would say. <laughs> right there. I would not stick around. Yeah, some of it is part of an older culture perspective. So if I'm I'm um, born in the '60s, so I I heard some of that mentality that was more of what men might say to women in the '40s and '50s, but it's still a not okay mentality. It's still toxic as hell. I think. Well, I don't think I know. It's it's just it's it's, it's inappropriate. So you can't talk. No, Emily, you have the covert narcissist. You can't talk to your husband. He's avoidant and mother enmeshed and it's a mess. Oh yeah, it would be a mess. Absolutely. Yeah. And everything he does happens to him. There's no self-awareness and empathy. Yep. You're talking. Yep. You're defining it really well. <laughs> Jennifer said she asked her husband uh, why he didn't care and if she, why he had no empathy. And he said, I don't know. <laughs> I love that. Well, what they've shown is that they actually, the brain, the uh, neuroimaging of their brain shows that that area is under-functioning. There's not as much activity, electrical activity in those areas. So he doesn't probably know why he doesn't feel anything. He probably feels cold. You know, he probably knows that he should feel something, but he doesn't, and he doesn't know why he doesn't feel it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's interesting. But it doesn't mean, Jennifer, just because he doesn't feel feelings for other people, doesn't, doesn't, so if you're broken up and sad and he doesn't really resonate with that, doesn't mean he can't put himself in your position and use what's called cognitive empathy, which is, which is uh, how we kind of imagine, if we put ourselves in somebody else's position, how we would imagine what it would feel like for them. You can still learn to do that, even if you don't have what's, he's, he's describing affective empathy. Yeah. Interesting white wolf. She says that her boss knows he's barely tolerated. So Emily said, if I watch, if I share my feelings, he says, I'm starting it. Yeah. Well, because here's why that, that, that ties into my toxic love that came out, my video that came out longer content that came out last week. 
the reason, oh no, it's coming out this week. The reason, yeah, it's coming out tomorrow or when Thursday. The reason they say that is because they, they do those things. They imitate us. And, um, so Idlewild says they're definitely alpha. Now Idlewild, I have read lots of articles on alpha males. I have. And I've heard that the, the study on wolves, I know, I'll, Emily, I'll get back to you. The study on wolves was, was only in captivity, not actually in reality. And then there was also another one, I think it was on Nat Geo, just a bit, this big write-up on it a while ago, talking about how it really wasn't in a lot of locations. So you're saying in some champ chimpanzees, it does actually exist. Interesting. But I'm hearing a lot of places where we used to, or even, there's is another one I heard. They they used to say that there was among, I think it was a deer population, there was an alpha male. But what they realized when they had women researchers come on board, start watching the same behavior, that what really was, it was a checking behavior. That they would look up and check and check and check. And when enough of the group checked in the same direction, then the group would lead into that direction and then head off together. But if you didn't know to look for the checking behavior, you would think that the lead deer decided we were heading and then headed and it looked like alpha behavior when it really actually was group behavior so i've actually i've read a lot and and, and watched a lot on it and they've actually a lot of people say there's not something to it so maybe there is and maybe there isn't but i find that kind of intriguing i think this and i know i'm off on a tangent i think it's sad that we put men into the box that that there is a higher up I don't think that we should. I think men should be able to be free to be whatever they want in whatever way they want. And if they don't want to necessarily always have to be the leader, they don't need to be. I think it's kind of sad when we do that. Okay, back to the comment that we were talking about. About, um, oh, feelings. Why he gets upset and says you're starting it when you share your feelings. Because people who are in who people who struggle with empathy and really understanding emotional response and sympathy and compassionate when they don't really have a lot of that tender feelings, they use emotions as manipulation. So when they're upset or anxious or cry or emote, when they emote, it's manipulative. That's why they, they, they show their tears in order to sway you. So when then when you start up with an emotion, even though it's natural, it's a an actual authentic reaction to the situation, their perspective is you're manipulating too. Because that's the only reason people would, would do that was for a purpose, for some secondary gain, for some gain. So then they view your, your feelings, your anger, your fear, your sickness, your tears, whatever, they view this as as a tool that you're using against them. Yeah. It's sad because then that means you can't be authentically present. You know, you're, you're now stifling and numbing your emotions in order for you to be, to, to, to sort of not instigate any tension between this person because they view everything that you're feeling suspiciously. Yeah, exactly. They're seeing it from their own lens. It's actually a form of projection. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mine did too. He was always the sickest in the house. You know, he would get upset and anxious. And when I was started to cry, he would see it as just, you know, I was going to ruin the day. Was I going to let the day get ruined? I mean, it was no, no room for my feelings. Not at all. Exactly. Yeah. It's, I'm glad that helps you feel very, more validated. And it is sad because it really, if we're not careful as a person who's in this relationship, Yes, you start stuffing your emotions. That's what happens. You start stuffing your emotions. So one of the things that we do in the Toxic Free um, Club, Relationship Club, is we actually help, we talk about learning to re-identify our emotions and getting in touch with our emotions because, you know, over time, when you stuff it enough, you actually start to check out and you don't know what you're feeling because you're learning not to feel. And the sad thing is you can't just unfeel sadness or stop feeling anger, you're, you're numbing and restricting all of your feelings. That means excitement and contentment and joy. All of those feelings are being, are being stunted as well. You lose the whole range. Well, good for you, Jennifer. Jennifer said her ex told her not to cry. And she said, I'm, you can't tell me how to feel. Yeah. Chances are though, your ex still thought you're being manipulative, you know, even though you said that, but way to stand up for yourself. That's awesome. I appreciate that. That's cool. So if you guys are looking to heal, I hope you consider joining Toxic Free Relationship Club. That'd be awesome to have you as members. 
Yeah, it, it comes out that when you start to open up to them again, um, I cry for no reason. It seems for some, it, it does feel that way, Phoenix. I agree with you that, I, okay, here's one of the, I grew up in a, I grew up in a home that was, had a lot of problems, a lot of issues and, and feelings weren't a lot in our house either. Yeah. The links in my, in my bio day, day. Um, so I wasn't allowed to feel a lot either. And so one of the things that I learned to do really early young on is how to cry silently. So when I cry, I make no sound. And actually, if you saw me cry within seconds, my face is white again. So it goes from this bright red, beet red upset to purely like white. I've learned to hide my my emotions that well. So one of the things I've really been working on recently is crying and making a noise. And I've been saying it's okay to make sound. Crying is normal. You know, crying with noise is normal. So I've I, recently I was upset about something, and I was yeah because I'm having a lot of anniversaries. <coughs> I just crossed over my wedding anniversary to my first husband. We would have been married 39 years. And uh, his the anniversary of my sister's death is coming up and the anniversary to his death is coming up. So I've been teary. I've been kind of sad lately. So I was crying about that one morning and I actually was making a noise and I was like, way to go. Way to go that I was able to actually, actually like make a noise. How many years since what spirited healer? How many years since... Yeah. Oh, since I was married to my first husband, he passed away in 2015. So it'll be eight years coming up. Eight years for us. Yeah. Well, this has really been a lot of fun. Any last big questions that you have for me before we wrap it up? I'm always here just so that you know, I'm always here on Tuesdays at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. And um, um, and we talk about various issues. I, I usually announce the topic if you ever want to know. Go, go, I go over to YouTube and you'll see it a day ahead. I announce it. So, you know, that we're going to be talking about whatever the issue is. And then today we're, we're, I, so they knew coming on that we we're going to be talking about devaluation. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm glad that you guys, some of you are saying you're trying to really work to give yourself permission to have emotion. And I think that's awesome. That's so, so important to do that. It really is. Divorcing, he has a new supply. Why is he so angry with me? Because <clears throat> that's back to the devaluation thing. I don't know if you caught any of that or not, if you missed most of it, but they have this unrealistic expectation and they have it of every partner they have that somehow you're going to like fix everything. And then when you don't fix it, it's a very primitive, very basic, like a very immature view toddler rage. And they never stop holding it out for you. You never get off you never like dis disappear from their mind. You always have let them down. And so they have it out to you, for you forever. You you will always be the, one of the people who've like disappointed him or betrayed him or or her. I mean, that's true for narcissistic women. But as a result, they kind of hold on to that. Yeah. <clears throat> so Phoenix, do I think a reverse dis discard is, re is a part of what? Now, let me, let me get, let me get, I get con this confused. So a discard is when they leave you and a reverse discard is when you leave them. Is that right? Please let me know that I got that right. <clears throat> there is no end of the devaluation, unfortunately, Phoenix. How do I know that I'm not projecting and I'm the narcissist? That's a great question. Everybody asks that. Yeah, they treat you so bad. Uh, yeah, okay. So they treat you so bad to get you to leave. That's thank you. Okay. Cuz sometimes you just sometimes you leave and they don't want you to leave and they're going to get that's when it's super dangerous. When you leave, when they don't aren't ready for you to leave, they they don't want the discard yet. Ooh, watch out for that. Yeah, guys, really be super careful about that one. You are in the most risk in this one. But um <clears throat> yeah, a lot of you are telling me what a reverse discard is. I get it confused in my head. I don't know why. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, but back to the question of how do I know that I'm not the narcissist? Okay. So I have some questions for you to help you know that you're not the narcissist. So when you look at all the relationships in your life, are you typically having trouble maintaining good relationships that you have problems? And I'm not talking about because you came from an abusive home. I'm talking about, so when you are away from that and you're just with normal, healthy people, or you're at work, are you having trouble creating, you end up creating a lot of drama and chaos wherever you go. That's the person who's doing that 
tends to be person who has a personality disorder. <clears throat> so before you met this person, how well were you functioning? Or did the function deteriorate once you met this person? That's another good sign. Um, and, and usually the person who's accusing you of being the problem, if they're the person who's creating a lot of the problems and the drama and the tension and the chaos, then they don't see it in themselves. And narcissists see it as it's part of who they are. They don't see this as a condition. They're not, they're not struggling with it like a cold or depression. It's part of who they are. And so they tend to accuse anybody who starts anything with them as the problem. They externalize and it, the blame for their problems and they don't take accountability. So that's another reason why you tend to be, those of us who are around this person ends up thinking we're the issue because we, they say that we're the issue. Whenever we bring anything up, they make us the issue. Or they say that there would be no issue if we would just be happy. Well, happy with what? It's usually never easy with these people. They go from making one mess to the next mess to the next mess. So how do you how how can you find happiness in that? Yeah, exactly. So synth girl to Texas or Texas says absolutely not. I had great stability at my work. I had good childhood friendships. I have no problems making friends. And then you met this person. Exactly. That tells you that your the problem isn't you. The problem came into your life, and then when this person leaves your life, you'll go back to being, you'll, you'll heal and go back to good functioning again. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's, it's very, Audrey, it is very hard to heal when you're in that relationship. I just heard psychologist Z on Instagram. I don't know if she's also on TikTok, but it was a really powerful video and I shared it on my Instagram story. So if you, you want to look for it, it's on my story today. She said, the reason we focus, it was about why demonize narcissist. And she said, because a narcissistically abusive relationship is one of the rare situations which, in which the cure is leaving. The cure of the situation is leaving. So please hear me on this. For those of you who are trapped, who are struggling, maybe you're feeling extremely confused. You're probably struggling with cognitive dissonance. And that's why my first course, First Steps to Leaving a Narcissist, is super helpful with that. So if you want some help trying to figure out where the problem's coming from and how to solve the problem, please check out that, that uh, course. But the, the best way through this is to leave. And I know that's so hard. I know that because they make it hard. They make it scary to leave. You feel super trapped. Yeah. Oh, wait, well, if I know that you're in the same situation as Audrey's finding yourself, only yours is with work and Audrey's is probably a relationship. And sometimes, unfortunately, it, we do have to suffer the consequences in order. It will cost us a lot to get out. Unfortunately, a lot of times it will cost us a lot. No, Phoenix, he's not going to allow you to end on with closure and he's not going to allow you to end on good terms. Absolutely not. Even if that there's going to be a brief period of time where he's going to seem amenable to you and you think, oh, it will go well. Mm -mm. That's just that is just a honeymoon phase of the discard. Please hold on because the hard phase is still to come up. So Big May said hers actually told her he was a narcissist and you just didn't know what it meant. Ooh, I'm sorry. Wow. Yeah, Audrey, they will do that. They will hover. They will hoover you back. Yeah. Well, he acted like it didn't bother him because he knew it would bother you, Debbie, to act like it didn't bother him. He wanted you to think that you were so little significance to him that he didn't care that you walked out. But trust me, he cared. And if you started in any way, you know, ask for something he thought was unfair, even if it's fair, he would let you know that he cared. It, it was just a tactic to do that. Yeah, Nikki, love bombing is really confusing. It does even the breadcrumbing, which is sort of the continuation of a smaller level of love bombing in the relationship. They do it to keep you in the relationship as long as they want you in the relationship until they're ready for it to end. Yeah. Yeah, they'll do that healing. I agree. They, the healing said they'll fight me in court and doesn't want the, re the relationship to end. Yeah, he doesn't want to end on your terms. He wants it to end on his turn, which is to annihilate you in the past. And the possibility. So this is the final question I'm going to take today because I got to head off here, but I have another appointment. But so healing 2023 says, how do I know that the, I am not in a relationship with some borderline personality disorder features? That's a really good question. Because I think that just like there's could be a mix of psychopathy, there can also be a mix of borderline personality disorder traits. And those traits are fear of abandonment and fear of you taking over and being 
engulfing their selfhood. And so what you'll see is this rage whenever there's a fear of losing you, which narcissistic wound does the same thing. So they, they kind of, in some ways, mirror. But the big difference between the two is narcissists are not constantly dysregulated with their emotions, whereas borderline personality disorders tend to be, they're unstably unstable. They're very, un, they're stably unstable. You can predict a lot of emotional dysregulation. Um, so yeah, it, it can be tricky. And here's the other thing. And I heard, I heard Sam Bankman say this, and I agree with him, is that a lot of the cluster B are really close to each other. So there is this fluidity. So sometimes you can have someone who has an MPD, but they'll show signs of ASPD or they'll show signs of PBD because of um, because they're so close. Their structures are so close. The t development of them are so close that they kind of move in and out of each other. So I guess what I'm saying, that was a long answer to say, I'm not for sure if we if it matters, I guess that's really what I'm saying. I'm not for sure it matters because the dynamics will still have the same impact on you. Yeah. Um, Phoenix brought up one last question. I think it's really, really good. And that is there is an upcoming webinar that I'm a part of June 22nd. I think it's 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard. No, it's 530. Yes, it's 530 Central Standard Time and 630 Eastern Standard Time called uh, Emotionally Bulletproof Kids how to help raise a resilient, emotionally resilient children. It is available and it, we go children, we're going all the way from teenagers down. So if you have a young child and you think, oh, it's never appropriate for my young kids, how to help somebody who's four. Yes, this will be very, very helpful. It is a panel, it includes several therapists. It includes a pediatrician. I will be on it as well. So if you're looking for help to raise emotionally resilient children in the midst of this chaos and drama, please check out and come to emotion, I've called Emotionally Bulletproof Kids webinar. It is June 22nd. And if you can't come, it's at 5.30 Central Standard Time, 6.30 Eastern Standard Time. If you can't make it, still buy a ticket because everybody who buys a ticket will get a free replay, lifetime access to a replay. It's going to be, I know I know the person who's hosting it. Lisa Sunny's hosting it. I know some of the questions. Her, her and I often talk. We're, clo we're very close friends. Um, so I often like I'm involved in her webinar. So I know what the topics are. These are psychologically deep topics about how do we help our kids grieve? How do we help them set boundaries with difficult parents who are high conflict parents? What do we do when our kids are terrified of that person? How do we help them when they have to spend time with this person and manage that person's issues? It is so, so helpful. So you can buy a ticket through my page. The link is in my bio. So, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's, but Lisa Sunny is the host for it, the event, and it's going to be an amazing experience. Again, if you're interested, uh, you can go to my, um, the link tree in my bio uh, and I know YouTube, it's not there. So I will, I will put that into the today's notes. So after this is over, I'll drop that in so you can see it. But, um, yeah, I hope to see you there. This has been fantastic. I love hanging out with you guys. Great questions today. I'll be back on Tuesday. And I'm not for sure what we'll talk about, but we'll be talking about something that's important to you all because I tend to listen to what you're saying. And we tend to talk about the topics you guys are bringing up. So thank you so much for those who are new to me. I really appreciate meeting you and hanging out with you today. It was awesome. You guys have a great rest of the week. Hugs to you all. Bye-bye.